Good morning and welcome to everybody who has joined our third series in the Irish Rural Link webinar programme. This morning we're talking about uh, working from home. And let's face it, we're all working from home, or a lot of people are. And for the comedians who have joined us as well, we welcome you because we hope you have a good career as well. And you may be able to work from home too. Uh, you will have all had the, the situation of working on whether it's Zoom or Microsoft or whoever, uh, the, the platform of cats walking in the background, children having to be fed, and all sorts of funny examples, which I think will keep comedians going for years about those people on, on these kind of platforms. Hopefully, nothing like that will happen this morning. Irish Rural Link, and my name is Seamus Boland, I'm the CEO. Uh, Irish Rural Link have a very clear policy going back over years. We want jobs in the regions whether it's the small town of Canvara, as mentioned by Tracy earlier in the conversation, or Ballycumber, where I live, or wherever. We want jobs in the regions. And it's been a tough old stint for governments over the years to try and deliver those jobs uh, that are meaningful and that, bring, that allow people to, to, live, to live there. And as you know, over the last few years, we've been living with the reality that the town and village have been stagnant. Uh, some would say dying, some would say a thing of the past. Well, that shouldn't happen either. So this morning, we have a really interesting panel uh, who are going to look at this issue. You are joined in, thank you. Please use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to put in questions, and we will definitely take those questions as we go along. It's an informal uh, conversational program, and we'll finish at 11. The first guest uh, I'm introducing you to is Kieran Conlon, who is Director of Public Policy uh, with uh, Microsoft. And uh, Kieran has also skin in the game when it comes to things like the action plan for jobs and is very interested in this. I know he has a broadband situation as well that he's, he's following, so he'll talk more about that. Tomasa Shiakon from the Western Development Commission, CEO. Again, the Western Development Commission is, is a, one of the finest organizations in the country, I have to say. They have promoted development in, in the West for a long, long time and have a great history. And uh, Tomas brings determination to that position as well. Tracy Cole, uh, co-founder of uh, Grow Remote, a very interesting organization, which I think you should check out on the website. Uh, grow remote are promoting uh, remote working, very simple. Um, and Tracy will make that clear. She's also community manager at the Bank of Ireland, and I'm sure she will be influencing uh, them as well if where, where she can. Uh, and of course, we have Sean DeLay, who is working in recruitment since 2013. He's uh, the marketing recruiter with GitLab. And again, worth checking out on the website because GitLab uh, very definitely try to recruit people totally from uh, a remote working situation. So I will begin, uh, Tracy, with you, if you don't mind, uh, because you co-founded uh, Grow Remote. Uh, and I just want to give, you, uh, give us an idea of what are you trying to achieve uh, with Grow Remote and the whole concept of working from home? For sure. So <clears throat> Grow Remote is a social enterprise and we're on a mission to enable us to work, live and participate locally. We're mostly interested in the live and participate, but in order to do that, we need to have work in our local communities. So we achieve that mission by making remote work both visible and accessible in our local communities. By remote work, it's not necessarily just work from home, but it is work that's available anywhere. And we concentrate on employment as opposed to entrepreneurship or freelancing outside of Dublin. And then we're in 50, 50 communities um, across Ireland, totally volunteer um, and in a couple of different countries. Thank you very much. Sean, um, GitLab, um, tell us about how good and how successful you've been at dealing with this issue. Uh, yeah, so I've been with GitLab for just over a year now. Um, and GitLab is the largest all remote company in the world. Um, so we currently have around 1,300 employees globally, um, located in about 67 different countries across the globe. Um, and I suppose the, the interesting thing with that is that we have such a wide talent pool um, and it makes us a lot more competitive when it comes to attracting top talent. You know, we're not restricted to the main tech hubs of you know, San Francisco, London, even Dublin. Um, we can hire all over Europe, 
um, Africa, Asia, and remote areas and rural areas in Ireland. And are you getting many people from rural Ireland? Would you be able to put a number as to people working in Ireland remotely? Yeah, so I think in total, GitLab has about 32 people in Ireland at the moment. Um, and some of them would be in Dublin. We have four in Cork, uh, two of what, which would be in West Cork. Um, we have one in Limerick, one in Ennis, one in Kerry, um, and then I believe we have someone in Belfast as well. Yeah. So, Kieran, um, talk to me about Microsoft and, of course, your work in terms of the action plan for jobs and what you think you and indeed Microsoft are bringing to this uh, conversation. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, Microsoft, well, everybody's pretty familiar with Microsoft, I'd say, but Microsoft are in Ireland 35 years now. Um, we've about 2,200 of headcount in, in primarily based in Dublin, uh, an office in Belfast as well. Uh, I'm with the organization about 18 months. Um, uh, my work straddles Dublin and Brussels, so I report into Brussels because of obviously the, the strategic importance of uh, Brussels from a policy point of view. Um, I suppose Microsoft's stated mission, which I think is why a large part of why I'm with the organization, is to empower every organization and every individual on the planet to achieve more. Um, so that's really at the core of what drives the business and it's about enabling enterprises and organizations and people uh, to do more, which is why I think it's very appropriate for this type of conversation that so much of what Microsoft's platforms do is enable people to work flexibly, work remotely. Um, just wearing a previous hat, um, uh, most of my time was in Irish politics before I got into, into the private sector and uh, I worked in government uh, with Richard Bruton between 2011 and 2016 as his advisor and uh, developed the action plan for jobs and the regional action plan for jobs model. Um, that was really uh, a response to an employment crisis at the time but also an understanding and recognition that the idea that any one government department, minister, agency or office had the, the, the magic solution to our employment crisis was, was a, a, a folly. And what the action plan for jobs and then subsequently the regional action plan uh, structure was designed to do was to pull in uh, insight, expertise and collaboration across the government system and then to try and devolve that model into a regional environment so that, again, it used to drive me mad, the idea, and, and it's, it's a long-standing model that all the answers were in a sort of square kilometer in, in Dublin too, and that the political system tended to facilitate this idea that you go to Dublin to try and get something to bring back to, to the, the constituency. And the regional action plan model was designed to try and uh, turn that conversation around and, and try and tap into the, the expertise and uh, specialities and strengths that were in each region and to break, to break away from the county by county model. Well, thank you, Kieran. I'm going to come back to you because there's lots of questions heading your direction. I might as well tell you. Lots of young people uh, listening, they've got a they really have got a liking for this working for remotely or working from home. And uh, I think between you and GitLab, they figure you'll solve it for them. But we'll come back to that in a moment. Tomas, uh, look, Western Development Commission, uh, I'm a real fan, have been from many years. Uh, they do tremendous work. Uh, I suppose looking at COVID, uh, Tomas, uh, how do you see uh, West, the, the Western Development Commission looking at this situation and getting jobs into the region now and in terms of what we've learned from this extraordinary crisis? Thanks, Seamus. I think one of the, 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 the key way to look at this, I suppose, is COVID in many ways has changed the conversation. If you were to ask me, the Western Development Commission is a state agency that's established for over 20 years. I came in as CEO from NUIGOVA shortly, about two years ago. And this is something that we were working on prior to COVID. And I think the trend towards remote working more broadly, obviously technology has improved, it allows people to work remotely more effectively. The, the push for a low carbon economy has meant that people are more open to looking at 
um, the less commuting and a, and a better work-life balance. And then thirdly, and I think this is the thing that has changed most significantly, is really the openness of both employers and employees, the change of mindset around, can this actually work? So while COVID obviously is both an economic and a health crisis and a tragedy on so many levels, to step to one side from that and look at it purely in the context of remote working, it has changed, I think, the conversation completely and changed the, the way in which people now consider remote working. And one of the things that's come home to me and the, the Western Development Commission, we're, we're based in the West, we have an office in Galway, Sligo, and, and the headquarters in, in Balahadreen. But I think there's been a tradition of working remotely to cover what's a dispersed region for over 20 years. So there's certainly a, a long track record in terms of remote working. But now when you look at how much things have changed, it's no longer a question of trying to get across to people what remote work is or working from home or using the different phrases. And that would have been very much the challenge at the beginning of this year to try and get over the communication step and say, this is what we're talking about. Now I think it's more about how we work remotely and how we use the technology. And to give you an example from the, our own organizational point of view within the, the Western Development Commission, like I say, we would have had a significant number of people working remotely, but not working remotely on a full-time basis across the board. So even for an organization like us that would have had people in those roles working remotely a number of days a week, there's still been a significant change. And I think when you look at that in the context of other companies or other organizations that had little, if any, experience of working remotely prior to this, then that's a, that's a massive learning curve. And, and one of the key things I think that we need to be most aware of is to make sure that while, let's say, uh, work we would have done with NUI Galway in terms of a national survey indicates that it's a largely positive experience, I think as this period of confinement goes on and, and it's great to see that the restrictions are being lifted, I think that it's important that people understand that this doesn't fully reflect the, the breadth of remote working and that it's more likely that we'd move towards some kind of a blended model that will give you the best of both worlds. Very good. Uh, Jay uh, or uh, Tracy, there's a, I have a question which I'm going to sort of sort of gear towards you. Uh, I've been home uh, working for the last two months with a group, with a company. She doesn't name them, thankfully. I won't name them either. Uh, and it, it's fantastic. It's great. They're a great company. Um, I was told I could ne we could never work from home or remotely. I've the last two months doing so, and it's working out great. However, I think working from home has its challenges. I would prefer if I could work locally and still work for the company I work with. Is that possible? And do you get many similar calls of that nature? Yeah, for sure. So obviously when we started off um, as community manager in Bank of Ireland and you're working with all of these different communities and they're trying to stop this commuters kind of that is everywhere. And what we realized very, on, very early on is that it needs to come from the root of the problem, which is the culture, technology and the policy within the company. So for, from that lady's perspective, <clears throat> she needs to, her company needs to um, enable a remote working toolkit that includes co-working spaces or something outside of her home. Most companies are looking at that. So if I'm right, GitLab do this too, but there's a website called remote, remotehub.io and on there you can search all of the jobs that are available and sort them by co-working stipends. And um, so again, remote working isn't working from home. It, remote, working from home is one part of remote working. So yes. most mostly when companies look are looking at remote working, they will have a suite of options that enable you to set up your workspace wherever it is that suits you best. Like if you're in Dublin city center, for instance, and you're in a two bed apartment, you're not necessarily going to be able to work from home, you know, so there needs to be other allowances and um, co-working spaces um, cost about 200 euros per month if you use them all the time. And there is about 300 all across Ireland and they're, they're listed on the NASEC, the National Association of Enterprise Centers on their website and also on techireland.org forward slash hubs. So you're given loads of, 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 we'll try and put them on our website as well today. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really good advice. And Sean, I think another question is, well, it's, it's really coming to you here. Um, there's quite a few. What will Microsoft, or can, you may not be able to say everything on behalf of Microsoft, but let's go with this one. Do you think companies like Microsoft or Google or all the big sort of high tech companies will review radically their policies in terms of learning from what COVID has brought about? Because there's one question here, I would love 
uh, to be able to work uh, for a, a large company, let's call it, she says, uh, but uh, it wasn't possible, so I, I had to leave. Will that, because of, of uh, infrastructure problems, do you think that's a big challenge of how do you think these companies should now look at their policies? Well, I think I'll just pivot off something Tracy said about culture, technology and policy, you know, uh, that it, that really is the core to the capacity to adapt to these type of changes. And I think Microsoft already have that uh, culture, technology and policy around accommodating remote working. Uh, our CEO, Satya Nadella, commented recently that we've seen two years of digital transformation in the space of about two months. So uh, Microsoft has moved almost overnight to a complete remote uh, working uh, solution. Um, we're not rushing back to the office. Um, we're going to have to manage our way back as others are going to have to do that. <clears throat> but there's, as people have tested and tried out the, the, the new model, it, they're embracing it uh, as, as is to be expected. And, you know, uh, over in research we've done, you know, three quarters of people are, are looking to, to continue working remotely. I think uh, what Tomas touched on about the idea of a hybrid model is my idea, my sense of where this will end up going. But I don't think there's going to be, we use the new normal um, uh, constantly. I think that is the reality that as we have had to adapt we found broadly that it works. There are challenges and there is still, people will still say that the number one form of communication is face-to-face. -face. So I think we will still need to retain elements of that. I think what is, I, and I think companies like Microsoft and other enterprise and organizations will, will adapt quickly because they have to for talent retention, for, for business purposes. I think one of the more interesting areas is seeing the transition and transformation within the public sector. Because in my experience, like it's a very sticky environment in terms of adapting to new models, new changes. Um, and I've seen from my interaction with the, the, the political environment, the pay, say the health service or social protection or the way enterprise is de de dealing with issues, that, that, that can't happen fast enough to be honest. And I think it's essential that, that that model gets embraced by the public sector because apart from it just being a better way of doing things, it is long overdue. And uh, it's one of the few ways that we will be able to address some other wider public policy challenges, I believe. Here's another, uh, Sean, I'm gonna go here. Uh, Sean uh, of GitLab, uh, um, some questions, just switch on your remote or your microphone there. In terms of what people are saying here is you're coming from the private sector effectively, it's a small company, um, and this will go to Tomas as well. Um, is there, what would you as a company like to see in terms of policy, in terms that would ease you in recruiting people and focusing them, maybe obviously from our sure links perspective, and indeed I'm sure everyone else here at this table and looking in, we would like more jobs in, in the regions. What do you, what would you like to see change or improve in this area? Uh, sorry, just to clarify the question, what would I like to see improve in terms of policy? policy and government I'm action, um, what are, what, are there issues that you'd like to clarify? I, I would imagine broadband coming in would be a good one, but anyway. Yeah, I think in terms of uh, recruiting people in a more rural locations, what's very important to remote working is, for example, a strong um, internet connection. Um, it's as Tracy said, you don't necessarily need to be work, uh, working from home. You can work from anywhere, but just once you have a strong internet connection, um, then you can connect to the rest of the company all over the globe. Um, so I think investing in infrastructure like that is definitely something that would be important. I also think something that could help a lot would be giving incentives to companies that were um, hiring remotely. Um, I've heard of a few uh, places in the US who have started to do that where they've noticed that their younger population is depleting in those areas and they give incentives um, for people to relocate to those areas and to work from there, even if they are working remotely. So I think that could be something interesting for um, the Irish government to consider as well. 
Tomas, uh, I'm going to throw you that question and I, I see you here, there's another question I'm looking at on the screen or my screen is, is what sort of jobs should we be attracting to the, let's say the West, which is in your remit, uh, that could actually uh, increase the numbers of opportunities for me as a, as a graduate coming out next year. So in other words, how many jobs do you think we could create if we got this right? I think that's the fundamental question, Seamus, and I think one of the things that we've been doing over the last number of months and we'll have further, we'll be in a position to, to publish further findings of this over the, the, the next couple of months, I suppose, in terms of infrastructure and policy, the, the, one of the main projects we're working on at the moment is developing a network of 100 hubs. We currently have 100 plus hubs from Donegal to Kerry and we're using that as a national pilot. So we're putting an IT infrastructure in place so there'll be a one-stop shop to book in real time the available space for these hubs. And I think why, first of all, going back to the earlier conversation about what is remote working, the next question is what is a hub and what does it offer? So we've just, we're just currently completing a classification of those hubs. And the reason we're doing that is that people will have a clear sense of what these hubs offer. But broadly, what those hubs offer are, I suppose, answers to some of the questions that we have found in, in engaging with the public. And that is, you know, people identify that they need a, a good workspace, both from the individual's point of view and from the employer's point of view, because it addresses some of the health and safety issues. The question of socialization is another aspect. So people can find themselves isolated if working remotely uh, from home all the time, whereas in an environment where they're working with others, they don't need to work for the same company but it gives them that social interaction and again addresses some of the broader issues like you know uh, fueling innovation that sometimes is is a worry for for complete uh, completely isolated working and then in terms of of work life balance again based on research that that we've done in recent months uh, on a national survey it indicates that people's inability to switch off so that the lines between work and home are blurred and that's a challenge for people so again i think the the, the hubs will address that then how that feeds into national policy, uh, we fed into work that was done last year uh, that, by the Department of Business and Enterprise, and that's that set out the, the, the broad policy parameters. But what's interesting in that is it draws an international example. So if you look at the UK, where there is an established right in legislation to flexible working, now that's that's more that's broader than remote working, but it does include remote working. So that would be a question that could be looked at here and to say, is this something that should be in We had a break there. Enshrined the legislation. Secondly, there is an existing for, and that's the question as to, to whether it should be incentivized. So is there from the, let's say, and it'll be very interesting to see in the, the context of government formation, what the, the broad thrust of the next program for government highlights in terms of the, the shift to low carbon. So is this something that would incentivize people to be based in their local area and then allow them to offset that perhaps against, you know, through reduced travel or anything else like that? But thirdly, and this is to come back to your pr primary question about the number of jobs, from our point of view, there is, there is the initial step of allowing people to work in hubs and that gives them somewhere to sit and somewhere to work that they can uh, identify as their own at a, at a reasonable cost. But more importantly, that can be seen as an economic driver in rural and regional areas. Okay. So where these hubs allow people to, to work very often, and based on some of the work that Jim Power did with Vodafone, He's taken a, 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 a view of the economic impact of a number of hubs nationally to say that it could, let's say, um, mean a, a boost of 300 million to the economy as a whole if you had one of these hubs based in each county. Now, we're, we're working, we've taken some of the information that Jim has and we're broadening that out to look at if you increase the numbers within counties. But I think the, the key assumption and one of the assumptions he made was that each of these jobs would be on average uh, would have an average salary of about 50,000, which would indicate most likely that they're probably, you know, that they, they might be graduate roles or they would be roles with specific skills. The benefit of locating people in these rural and regional areas is where you bring people and allow them to work in an area, then there is a multiplier effect. So the hairdresser, the butcher, the pub, the shopkeeper, it benefits the, the, um, the, the rural area as a whole. And it changes really something that's happened over the last generation, which was all of these market towns that were driven by agriculture where people came to sell, whether it was vegetables or animals or whatever in the, in the middle of a town. And that was the driver for economic activity. That has fundamentally changed. And that's not necessarily something that's going to come back. So I think the scope 
to look at hubs and remote working. And finally, the beauty of remote working is it's not similar to, let's say, IDA coming with a company in a particular sector. So it's, it, it doesn't matter what sector you work in, it applies in today's world for virtually anybody that works uh, across from a screen. So anybody that does the, the majority of their work on a screen is really somebody that, that can look at the scope to remote work. And that's why we see it as a very important factor in terms of rural, eco, rural and regional economic growth. Can I come in on that, Shane? Yes, just, come ahead, so, come ahead, Karen. That's the idea. I'll add, add a little bit to that as well, which I think Tomas is on the money on, on that. Um, and, and just again, reference the Tracy's point about culture. In my experience, there's, there's few individual policy levers that can do anything approaching what a change in mindset and culture will do. It's like trying to turn the tanker around, you know, and that's where I think the opportunity really lies at the moment in fundamentally changing the culture and seeing that it's a culture shift rather than a specific policy shift. If you change the culture and have uh, politicians, officials, agencies, organizations, enterprises thinking culturally that this is an option, it, it will happen, I won't say organically, and certainly you need to support it with, with the broadband, with the potential policies to support. So I would just, that would be my instinct to really drive the culture mindset about change, changing that so that this is all viable and possible and get that locked in. In terms of, of the policy levers, um, I think the idea of the hubs is great. I think you also need to be thinking slightly more regionally as well in terms of clusters and building out existing strengths so that you have a, a more of a, you know, a regionally driven agenda. Uh, and that's certainly, in ter and in terms of targets, let's go for tangible targets in terms of employment. I know when we did the action plan for jobs and then the regional action plans, we set high level targets, which drives the policy process. And I know at a regional level, we set this target of having no region more than 1% different to another in terms of unemployment levels, when you already had, say, the Southeast at 18, 19% unemployment at one point versus, you know, I think uh, Midwest was actually quite strong and, 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 and Dublin was, was reasonable as well. So tangible policy goals are important, but I, I would start with driving culture. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Tracy, I see you're coming in, but I want to, uh, Deirdre Garvey is, is really worried. I know Deirdre very well, very worried that what sort of technology is best to deal with that relationship stuff, you know, the soft stuff. Uh, what I suppose Tomas was talking about the face to face. Is there a technology? Is it possible to do that kind of uh, work remotely and, and overcome the barriers? I know Dennis Nocton has a kind of a similar question, uh, and his others as well. We come to around work life balance. Uh, can we develop uh, a, a remote working? Uh, system that actually deals with the work-life balance because as somebody has already said you can actually end up working harder remotely than than you would if you're in an office so that relationship stuff Tracy how do you see so, that developing yeah so a couple of things and um, one is that um, somebody asked there about social interaction should we generate yeah. up a network of hubs there are networks of hubs and um, there's also networks of remote workers again there's 50 across the country they're led by local volunteers on changex.org you can see all the map of all the communities locally and access them and um, then just to link a couple of points together particularly around the hybrid model and the culture what we're seeing in big companies is that they're surveying their teams the teams are coming back with a third a third a third a third want to go back into the office and don't talk to them about remote a third want to be two days in three days out and a third want to be fully remote and sean ceo uh, talks a lot about this but the key to unlocking all of that as a hybrid team is remote first culture so everybody acts as though they're remote. So when there's eight people in the office and two people remotely, everybody logs in their own individual device um, to attend the meeting. And that's equal, um, equal access to people, information, context, and therefore opportunity. Um, and so that's kind of around the remote first side and then leads, le, le, goes into Deirdre's question. I know Deirdre has done a huge amount of work on this stuff for many, many years. Um, but... There isn't necessarily, in, in my experience, a particular technology that would fix that. It is deliberate and intentional um, setting up of your culture and those interactions that you are, 
you're you're putting in place the the processes maybe or the ways of working or the culture that encourage people to collaborate across the team so it isn't necessarily um a tech answer uh, but if you don't mind i'll just answer one more question which came yes, in from kevin because kevin was saying that the public sector are overlooked public sector much to kieran's point right and rena carl is on this call rena carl set up a teleworking ireland 22 years ago and was on this with the public sector right so long time coming for sure and um, they are working on it so we're working with three division three departments who are working on it and, and organizations they're just being quiet about it at the moment because it is a pretty big transformation they don't want to come out with it and um, but also Yvonne Foy is on the call from Leech and Offaly ETB and together with Solace and IDA they launched the first national training course in remote work and the next program of that will be focused on one particular public sector team so if we can take them enable them pilot them we can then roll it out across or at least provide the resources and information to other groups so definitely kevin and i hope all is going well in connemara but um, it, it, the public sector uh, aren't forgotten from, from our perspective they're they're a pretty big enabler excellent tomas uh, i see carolyn bryant has a question about uh, college students working or studying from home as well so that's an interesting one i know we're talking about work this morning uh, and I know I want Kieran to come in as well on this one as well. A lot of questions, I have to say, are saying uh, the broadband infrastructure is our biggest enemy in, in this one. Uh, and obviously, I, I'd say this up front, I'm sure I I made it very clear, no questions. We want the full broadband spectrum delivered to every part of Ireland. No messing, no questions, just do it. And I think COVID is proving that. But a lot of questions on the broadband. Uh, I'll start with you, Tomás. No, James, I would agree. And uh, to be honest, I think there's political consensus that broadband, okay, where there may be, you know, slight differences in terms of the, the rural urban view on it. I think there is now a political consensus that the contract is signed and that will happen. But I think there, that is in the medium term because realistically it will just take time. It involves, you know, laying fiber cables and it's, it's going to take a certain amount of time. Again, going back to the, the hubs, I see the hubs as a stepping stone. And I, and I know that more broadly that we're working, let's say, with communications in our own department, rural and community development to look at what's coming down the tracks as part of the National Broadband Plan, these uh, broadband community points, so that they will allow people who haven't access to broadband a, a stepping stone. Um, and, I, and I think, again, going back to the, the, the shift in culture, and I would agree with both um, Kieran and Tracy in terms of what they're saying, that's absolutely key. Uh, something that we found anecdotally, and this has been backed up in terms of some of the, the research that we've done, is that there was a huge amount of remote working happening uh, in the public sector. And I think that's the reason I'm talking about the public sector is I think that's where perhaps the biggest shift has to happen. But there was a huge amount of remote work happening but ver and a huge amount of it was under the table for want of a better term. So it was on a one-to-one -one basis. It wasn't at a systemic level. There wasn't a clear policy in place. And I think that's changing. And I know from conversations that we're having with the departments and where we're working with the departments on this, there is an appetite for change and that precedes COVID. And I think that now has gathered speed during COVID because it's, it's seen as a way to facilitate, um, you know, the, what people want. One key thing I would point to, and I'm almost afraid to mention the word decentralization. Decentralization as a theory made a lot of sense. Well, one of the key issues around it was the, the absence of critical mass. So to put this in a different context, we're part of what we do in the Western Development Commission is making is telling people about what life in the West of Ireland has to offer them. When people want to move, they have two questions. First of all, I'll move for a job, but what about my next job? In other words, can I build a career? And secondly, very often it involves a spouse. Uh, so they say, my wife or my husband wants a job. Can they get a job? So they're the two key, two key questions. And I think the same thing applies to um, the, the public sector in terms of allowing people to work remotely. And this goes to what Tracy talks about, about remote first in mentality. People can't suffer by not being in the room. And I think that is the experience of decentralization that uh, all the senior um, leaders within the public service stayed in, in that square mile that Kieran talked about at the outset. And that has to change. So you have to see people at senior levels, like assistant secretary level, willing to, to take on remote working for it to be acceptable across the public sector, because that then, uh, it makes it clear to people that you can have a remote job which can lead to a remote career and that you won't be held back because of the fact that you're you're not uh, in the office and avoid the situation where you're turning up in, in the office for the sake of it. 
Kieran, I'm going to move the broadband, but also again, Maura Farrell has the same question about uh, students studying from home over the coming months. Um, you know, where are we in terms of our thinking there? This has implications, of course, for universities in a major way. Uh, and maybe you, you may, may not be able to speak fully on it, but still, uh, I would imagine coming from Microsoft, you have uh, some interest in how studies are managed and from where, etc. Is this a, is this the beginning of a new situation in terms of uh, studying? Absolutely, it is, and uh, to use the old hackneyed phrase, there's threats and opportunities. I would say um, Microsoft, uh, just a project I've been working on at UCD, we, we've just launched a, a new master's in digital policy studies, um, which is is in part trying to help change that culture and mindset by bringing more um, what would often be social scientists and gen generalists in the civil service that get moved from one area to the other. And maybe you know you become an expert in trolleys or, or hospitals, and then to get a promotion to AP, you're, you you need to become a work permits specialist, and you you move along. So, but I know from talking to UCD that the the course is due to start in September, and we've got cert and diploma and masters. And if people are interested, they they can find it on Twitter and LinkedIn and whatever. Um, but they're having to evolve the model to accommodate uh, the capacity for bringing in people from Brussels. We're hoping to involve people from the institutions and the parliament and so forth. Um, so that's, again, changing the wheel on the car as you're driving down the motorway a bit. Um, but again, they're going to have to, the, 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 the funding in universities is going to take a big hit from international students if they can't get the international students signed up, which is a bit of a a cash driver, an income driver for the institutions. So they'll have to develop the model to make sure that they can either accommodate those international students or increase their capacity for local students and get more headcount through uh, remote remote learning. So that model is, is evolving, I know, as, as we speak. Uh, to, to pivot back to the broadband issue, yeah. um, uh, I, there, there's, I don't want to say that broadband isn't the sort of magic sort of fix all, but like lots of parts of the country have decent broadband, but haven't managed remote working because the culture wasn't there to accommodate. I'm so with you. Yeah. So yeah. there's enough, there's enough broadband in the country to accommodate a lot of remote working if the culture drove that and underpinned that. Um, so there's a, and again there's a danger that all the energy will go into saying can we dig trenches faster and can we put up masks quicker and, and, and all that will happen but the political system can get hypnotized by something like that and think that doing x will make y happen when there's all these levers that they can use already that are driven by culture um, so um, for sure, uh, Microsoft has a strong commitment on uh, broadband. We have a program called Airband. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a commercial uh, element of the business, it's actually part of the division that I'm a part of, which is corporate, external and legal affairs. It's seen as almost a philanthropic endeavor where we make uh, source code and patents that Microsoft have available on an open platform basis. So you can deliver uh, broadband connectivity over the broadcast spectrum. Um, so where you have your TV and radio signals in the gaps between where your RTE1 and your, your, your Today FM channel is, if you manage that spectrum dynamically, you can deliver a broadband service. And it's, a, it's very popular in the States, South America, Africa. And when I joined the company, I saw this because of my local experience. I said, why aren't we making use of that? Because it's a relatively fast rollout. Uh, and certainly for remote locations, because it's the broadcast spectrum, you're not relying on line of sight uh, for connectivity. So in mountainous, forested areas, the end of a headland for those remote areas airband is a is a real solution uh we've got a pilot project operational with chagask uh up in their college in valley hayes where we wanted to develop the concept of uh precision farming enabled by broadband for for the farming community um but we've connected up people over you know a range of five to ten kilometers we picked cabin because of the drumlins because of the challenging environment 
we've proven the concept. Microsoft have committed to getting 3 million Americans connected by 2022, uh, working with different operators in different states. Uh, and, and again, Microsoft, it go, go, comes from Microsoft's mission about empowering people. If you don't, in a modern environment, if you don't have broadband connectivity, you're at a loss. And certainly with my former political hat on, it's one of the key drivers of that insider-outsider divide. And if we don't meet that culturally, we're, we're storing up problems long-term. So as off the back of that pilot, we're now in discussions with rural and community development about uh, rolling out additional projects uh, in multiple locations around the country and hopefully partnering with the local library network as well. So it's something that we're passionate about, something that I've got a lot of reasons to be passionate about um, and hopefully that will make a contribution. But in terms of accelerating rollout and linking in with the broadband connection points that Thomas referenced, it's the type of thing that would enable people still work from their home rather than having to park in the in the GAA car park or community center or I, I think maybe not a great idea of parking in the, the primary school car park with a laptop in, in, in no. your house, you know? Probably, probably <clears throat> not. Sean, you referred to incentives and we're, we're really talking to, and I, I, Tracy was really nodding vigorously about the culture and getting the whole idea of, of remote as part of our culture. Sean, you referred to incentives uh, that could maybe to encourage people to do so. In, when you're recruiting, what incentives would you like to see? Can you offer? Or how do you manage that culture that we've just talked to as a, a vital ingredient in terms of uh, working remotely? Yeah, so I mean, there, there are a ton of incentives to working remotely that I speak to candidates about. And, you know, most of the candidates that I interview on a day-to-day -day basis have not worked remotely before. Um, so there's always an education piece around that. I myself had never worked remotely until I worked with GitLab. Um, and, you know, the incentives are that obviously there's less commuting, there's less um, cost, um, there's more freedom in terms of spending time with family, spending time with friends, um, doing hobbies, doing exercise, um, and just staying in their areas that they want to stay in and, you know, not having to you know, move to Dublin or to London or wherever they're located. Um, and I think, as Tracy said, what's very important is that it's in the culture of the company and it's coming from the top down. Um, it's very difficult, I think, for employees to persuade upwards of the incentives of working remotely. Um, and we have a lot of information on our website. Um, I think the link is uh, gitlab.com slash company uh, slash all remote and there's a ton of info on there for companies who are looking to transition to a remote model um, and shifting the culture um, and you know what's important to keep in mind when moving to a remote model is that it's not the same as working in an office but you just switch to working from home you have to change your processes have to invest in tools have to default to documentation and asynchronous communication um, as opposed to replacing every single meeting you would have in the office with a video call. Um, because, you know, there, it's, it's just not productive and it's um, an older way of working, I think. Um, and you just have to put more trust in your employees that they're still going to do their work. Um, but you just don't need to be viewing them all, all the time. Lots of questions coming in still about coverage and broadband and Rose Conway Walsh talks about uh, mobile coverage, etc. Sean, just to finish off that, when you get people applying for jobs that you're recruiting or trying to get in, uh, are, there, are there worries from the company's point of view or from the person applying as to whether they can do it or not? Or what sort, what sort of reassurance would you give the people who want to do this to work from this situation? Yeah, I mean, I think in GitLab, we're in a privileged position in that we're all remote and always have been. So we have very good practices in place already and a very good support system for when employees join. Um, so I suppose in terms of speaking with candidates, I always reassure them in that, 
you know, I had never worked remotely before. I did have worries about moving to that model, um, but have adapted to it very well, as do 99% of the employees that join GitLab. Um, and that's because of the culture of the company and that we have intentionally put processes in place to foster um, productive working from home or working remotely. Um, and that, I think that's the most important thing that their employees feel supported um, in their remote working environments. Tracy, when you founded Grow Remote, uh, and here's, I'm linking to a question, are there particular types of jobs that are more favorable to remote working and there are other jobs simply will never adapt? And I suppose the obvious ones would be the trades and stuff like that. At the end of the day, you can't fix somebody's washing machine from uh, you know, a hub somewhere. You know, you have to actually visit and, and expect it. So what kind of jobs favor working remotely and what don't? best line that I heard was anything with your hands needs to be done in person, anything with your head can be done remotely. So everything, um, and, and this is back to maybe Kieran's point around broadband, that whatever kilometre that are, there is in Dublin, um, and empowerment, um, just to link them. Um, I heard a community, a definition for community development when I was doing the community work with Bank of Ireland that I loved, which was empowering people with the tools and resources to make change in their own environment. So it's not going up to Dublin and asking them for something. It is what it's asset-based community development, I guess, right? And broadband is outside of our control as lay people in our communities. But even when we have it, it is not at all a magic bullet. So it's a bit like plugging electricity into a house, but not knowing where to buy the light bulbs or not knowing where the switch is. It's useless if you don't have the jobs to layer on top of that. Um, and I've actually forgotten the question already, Seamus, but I've got to be in my bonnet about this, so I'll keep going. So um, Sean there, right, works for, for GitLab. HR, legal, finance, everything in GitLab. There are I probably, I don't know, around 30 jobs that are available today on GitLab's website. They do not care where you are. Um, and there's probably a co-working space beside your home if you don't have um, access it dire directly into your home. It's not perfect, but the jobs are there and the connectivity is probably somewhere around you. And I think there's a lot to do with our own culture in the community space of working with what we have. Um, I think there's still a notion that we're going to wait, that there's going to be a big bang of remote. The problem with the likes of GitLab is that they're never going to open up in Tubbercurry because they're fully distributed. They're without a location. They operate in a time zone. So we need to change our own mindsets and think the jobs are already here. We need to go and get them. So there's a rant in, in response to your question. Yeah, too. As, a, as I said, now I'm not going to, there's lots of you asking questions about the, 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 the plus and minuses of different types of broadband systems, wireless systems. Uh, some uh, people are saying, you know, wireless has its ups and downs. So I'm not going to get into that debate uh, in terms of the questions coming in. But certainly, uh, the, but most of the questions, and I'm going to you, Tomas, here, are from people who are thinking of, uh, and I think young people from the sound of it, who are looking at careers that will enhance their opportunities to choose whether they work remotely or whether they work in the office in Dublin or whatever. Um, so is the Western Development Commission looking at the kind of careers that people are more likely to join or want to be involved in if they want this option in terms of working? Yes, it's a short answer. I mean, fundamentally, our role as a regional development authority is to make people aware of what the, the West, offer, uh, West uh, offers them. But I would agree with Tracy in terms of, you know, it, 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 not only in the context of broadband, there, there isn't a, a magic bullet here that there will be a huge change overnight. So there will be incremental change. But I think what you're seeing at the moment is now that that process has speeded up hugely because of what's happened with COVID over the last four to five months. So in terms of, uh, let's say, what, what's on offer to people, before COVID came along, there was a broader shift among younger workers to what they call protein careers or, you know, do a bit of this for a while, do a bit of that for a while, which was a huge mindset change from, let's say, both the, the older generations who would have looked for a job for life. Now, very often a job for life was located in one area, but the two are interlinked and why it's important that people are able to move from career to career is that it doesn't tie the job to the location. So if for argument's sake, 
And this goes back to my point about being able to build a career as well as get a job. If you move to Galway or move to Sligo or move to Donegal for a job, the important thing is that you can get your next job. And those that are equipped to work remotely are in a position to do that because while their skill set may change, the fact that they can work remotely and have experience of working remotely is, is a, a, a key part and will be of interest to employers that are open to remote working. The one benefit to take away from the crisis that we've been through at the moment is that virtually everybody has had exposure to remote working. So now it's something that, okay, they're not at the stage of being, you don't have qualified remote workers, but the fact that they have some experience leads them to the next question of what do I know, what do I not know? And then with the likes of Grow Remote, who we're working very closely with, Grow Remote have the kind of courses and supports that allow people to take that next step, uh, both for employees and employers. And I would think that the, the key focus over the next number of months, and from our point of view, that this is something that we're, we're very fixed on, we're, we're in the, 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 the testing stages of what we call it is a talent tool, that the intention is to identify those that are willing to move um, uh, should the opportunities arise, and then we'll be able to work with employers to flag that, to say, well, you know, if, you, if you're open to advertising jobs, either location-based in any of the area of the West or on a location-less basis, that we can tell you how many people are available. So I think it's, it's, it's twofold. And I think the key challenge over the next coming months will be to look at that employer mindset shift, that if the restrictions are eased, that employers don't go back to the way things were. It's unlikely that they go completely back, but I think if you take Tracy's earlier third, 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 that employers are equipped to deal with both the, the middle third who want a blended approach and the third that want to work from home. And I think that's the key challenge in the coming months. Okay, here's a question. Uh, I, I really, Tracy, I'll ask you to start it and maybe Kieran to come in as well. And I want to blend a couple of questions here. One is Barry Symes is saying, companies may take advantage of people working remotely, it's cheaper and they may suppress some benefits or maybe make it difficult, to, uh, make it difficult. Uh, in other words, it's cheaper to live in rural Ireland so therefore we don't have to pay you as much or you may not have the same benefits or because of your disconnection you may lose out. Uh, Michael Kenny is saying that it is there are mixed reactions to working remotely and working uh, in, in, let's say, the main hub, whatever that is. Um, so what are the protections, I suppose, both questions are alluding to? How do we make sure that we don't blow this one if we get it right? Mm, yeah, I think the pay thing is a really interesting debate. Um, like there's lots of different sides to it. For me personally, just in terms of my gut and my instinct, if I'm not commuting two hours each way every day, am I going to agree to being paid less? I definitely wouldn't hire me into a sales role if I was going to agree to be pay, paid less for that. And I'm not sure how my location, much like my gender, anything else impacts on my ability to do my job. However, it does get really interesting when you're talking about somebody, there's a role that's 60,000. And on San Francisco, that person might be able to afford a home. And in Galway, they might be, you know, driving a Merc. And, and that's really unfair within the team. And I think GitLab might have a calculator for how they adjust per country. Um, and I think that's probably the way forward that there's some slight adjust, just adjustment. I don't think there should be an adjustment within the island of Ireland. I think that's, some companies may do okay. it, let them, I think we'll weed them out. Uh, before I go to Sean, Kieran, uh, do you see difficulties or do you, how do you see workers being, if you like, protected and made sure they're not taken advantage of? Well, sorry. Uh, at one level, you have the standard uh, uh, HR uh, and employment rights legislation, you know, it's there to protect everybody. You know, if you have a contract of employment, you know, it, it sets out there are, there are uh, uh, rules and laws protecting you. So, so that's at one level. I don't see that there would be any uh, diminution of that regardless of uh, location. Um, but also, ultimately, I think the market will drive it as well. Um, you know, uh, getting good people and retaining good people is the key to, to business success. And I know, you know, on all the trade missions that we did when we were trying to get the economy back up, up and going, that the war for talent started to be coined as a phrase. And that really is the sense of it. So I think enterprises when they look at the COVID experience and the remote working, people people are more productive. So the CSO report that said, and this is something that will need to be watched in the context of remote working, that, you know, 
people are doing an average of 38 hours more per month. So we basically squeezed an extra week's work by working remotely, which I don't believe is particularly sustainable, but um, you know, enterprises will start to see the practical benefits. And from a public policy point of view, we saw my, my former boss talking yesterday about the impact of remote working on climate change targets. So there are lots of policy rationales for this to work. I think the train is leaving the station. How many carriages we tag onto the back of it and what those carriages look like are, are really are really for, for debate and discussion now. Okay, Sean, just there was a quick um, uh, statement there by, by Tracy, which said that there, you, you might know something about uh, the way, uh, let's say wages or salary or whatever are adjusted depending on the country or whatever. Can you, do you know anything about that? Yeah, so uh, GitLab's compensation team has um, built an open source compensation calculator that's completely open to the public where you can go in, put in the role that you're interested in and where you're located, and it will um, put out the range uh, that we will be paying for that role in that location. Um, so our comp team based that on uh, research of what the cost of living and um, the average wages are for those roles in that location. Um, and the reason that we adjust um, ranges for different uh, locations um, is because it, it, it makes business sense for the company and which allows the company to then hire in various different locations. So like, as Tracy said, you know, you couldn't be paying someone in San Francisco which is one of the most expensive places to live in the world, and West Cork, the same wage, even though we want to hire in both locations. Um, so, you know, if we were paying everyone at the highest rate, which would be the San Francisco rate, for example, this would lead to higher compensation costs, which would mean that we could hire less people, which would mean that there'd be slower results and lower results for GitLab as a company. Um, and if we were to pay everyone at the lower rate, then we wouldn't be able to attract people in, in locations like Dublin, London, San Francisco, um, which we want talent from those locations as well. Um, so that's why we need to uh, balance out and adjust to the location that people are based in. Okay, we're coming, we're not too far away. Tomas and Kieran, there's, two, there's a question which seems to be directed, but any of you can join in, but it's a quick question, a very simple question. Does Brexit offer opportunities, it's coming from Kevin McShane, uh, for remote working? Uh, do you see Brexit as an opportunity here? Um, there, there are opportunities with Brexit. I'm not particularly sure they're, they're specific to to remote working. I know certainly from my, my former colleagues in the IDA, there was a, a lot of strong pipeline of, of companies hedging uh, by, by relocating an office or a function to Ireland. And there is a there was a regional dimension to that because it was maybe a 20, 15 person operation. They weren't necessarily looking to be downtown Dublin or, or, or whatever. So they, they were looking at locations outside Dublin. So definitely a regional economic potential from Brexit for, for those hedgers uh, that want to have an operation in Ireland uh, to keep a foothold in Europe. Okay, okay. Quick yeah, I might add to that, Seamus, just to say that um, there, are, there are marginal opportunities in Brexit, but across the board, Brexit is not a good news story. And I think, in, you know, it, it, while COVID has taken a huge amount of the focus from it, I know particularly from the Western region that we deal with, for areas like Donegal, Leitrim, Sligo, it will have a very significant impact. Because really, to look at the economy of the Northwest, it needs to include the economy of Derry, which is among the, the biggest urban settlements in the, in, on the island. So to remove that or put it, almost put a wall around that really creates huge yeah. issues. So I, I don't see, uh, unfortunately, there are only marginal benefits. I might just touch on one other point that I saw raised in the questions, which I think is an important point. Please just do. in terms of what we've gone through over the last few months, the, the issue of childcare, as I mentioned in the questions, I think that's, that's a very important issue because that's part of the issue that feeds into people blurring the lines between work and, and rest and also having a manageable situation and having a, a dedicated space. So I think it's important that people realise that I see that as an unna unnatural situation attached to COVID and I think that will have to be resolved both at a national and at a local level. Obviously people had you know, pre-COVID childcare arrangements 
uh, it, it, it makes it very difficult. It adds huge complexity and it's just something that, that will need to be factored in going forward, I think, as part of the policy response. Okay, we're, we're, we're slightly, we're almost at the end. I think that's a, <laughs> the most really most important issue facing so many families uh, post COVID. And I think very, thank you very much for raising that. Here is a sort of a 10, 15 second answer to each of you, please, because we're, really, we're at the end of time. And uh, I'll start with Tracy and I will go around. Uh, just tell me what you want to see happen. If you were minister in the morning, what would you want him or her to do to make Grow Remote or remote working from uh, remotely possible? And, and the easy question to you, Tracy. Okay, so on one side, we could have we could have incentives. We could have a lot of things. We could have do what Tuzzler and Mo do, pay people 10 grand to come to rural Ireland or whatever. That's not actually what I'd like to see. I'd like to see, oh, we've got a bias for action and grow remote. Somebody asked a question there around what are the IDA doing? What can we do to get the IDA to, to do more? The IDA have landed two of Ireland's largest remote companies. The IDA are doing loads. We need to go and we need to meet them halfway and we need to take responsibility, get educated, build up awareness, all that kind of stuff. When you say we, who's we? Us as community people. Us as community people. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, like that's not a, it's not a, sometimes I say like, it's like we're selling the sustainable diet versus the six week fad, you know, and, and that is it. But we as people need to educate ourselves around what remote work is, where to find it, et cetera. And we'll have sure. to do Sean, same question to you. Minister in the morning, what would you want, one thing you'd want done? Um, I agree with what Tracy said of like, I would like to see just a little bit more awareness of remote working in the community in general. Um, you know, I think as Tracy had pointed out um, in discussions before that there's a lot of people just in rural communities who don't realize that these opportunities are already there in companies such as GitLab. And GitLab is just one. Uh, we, there's a ton of uh, all remote companies out there. Um, and you can actually find some of, the, some of the other ones on our website as well. And so it just takes a little bit of research. So I'd love to just see a little bit more awareness. And, um, you know, that's why I think things like this and uh, Tracy's Grow Remote are really great initiatives. Brilliant. Kieran. Um, if I was minister in the yeah, morning, if you were if you were him in the morning, if I was writing the the program for government on this, I would have a, a hard commitment that the public sector would have thirty percent of its public and civil servants working remotely within eighteen months, and I would link uh, discretionary uh, funding streams from uh, finance to the achievement of those targets. And if you manage to get 120,000 public sector workers mobilized to work remotely, that creates a, a huge ripple effect in terms of culture and impact. Certainly eases the traffic and the congestion. Uh, Tomas? No, I would agree with that. I think the, the key aspect is the, the public sector because of the broader impact it will have. And then finally, from the point of view of the Western Development Commission, I think the, the what working hubs and co-working hubs and enterprise hubs and digital spaces what they all collectively offer is the root of something that I'm very confident um, will, will offer huge scope to develop uh, rural and regional communities over the coming five years. I think remote working is the first step, but there's a much longer journey to go. And I think if there's an openness to what those hubs and focusing economic activity in those, in those rural areas, I think that's vital. And I think that, that would lead to a very, um, what I would hope would be a, a hugely ambitious future for all those areas in the coming years. Okay, well, look, we've, we've come to the end of this morning's series, webinar. And on behalf of Irish Rural Link, firstly, to thank you, Tomas, Tracy, Kieran, and Sean for participating in what was a very interesting discussion. And I, I'm not the judge of that, but certainly looking at the texts and the questions we've got in and from the people who have registered, uh, this is a subject that is really in the hearts and minds of people at the moment, particularly in rural Ireland. So. Uh, firstly, thank you for being with us as a panel. Thank you who have joined us in terms of putting your questions and listening. And I'm sure you will be on the various websites mentioned uh, by Tracy. Uh, start with Grow Remote, start with uh, GitLab, uh, start with, with uh, Microsoft and of course the Western Development Commission. And of course, visit Irish Rural Link as well, uh, because you might also want to join us as a member. Next week, we want to be talking about 
the issue of bringing the hospitality sector back into work. Tourism is one of the big rural uh, money spinners and it's costing, uh, it's, it's, it's worth around two billion a year. Uh, many of the small businesses in that area, in rural areas, are in the, safe, in the, in the uh, hospitality area. So we will, Board Fauci will be on, we hope to have a minister as well. So this time next week at 10 o'clock, please join us. Thanks to all of you for your participation and enjoy and please keep safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Janice.